Welcome to our podcast series, Talking with Traders, hosted by expert trader Garth McKenzie in London, from where he's interviewing various guests on the topic of trading. Welcome back to season seven of Talking with Traders. We're now into the fourth year of this podcast since it started in early 2020. Once again, IG have come on board as our sponsor for this season. We are truly privileged and grateful to have such a global leader in CFD trading as our sponsor. Over the coming weeks, I'll be interviewing various guests from around the globe on the topic of trading. Some will be follow-ups with past guests and some will be new guests. The idea behind this podcast is that you get a variety of views from a broad spectrum of market professionals. None of what you hear in these episodes is intended to be financial advice, but it is intended to get you thinking about how you might be able to apply what you hear here into your own trading and investing. Please remember to subscribe to this podcast in your favorite podcast app. That way you'll be notified when new episodes are released. Once again, thank you to IG for funding and sponsoring this podcast into its fourth year. And thank you listeners for tuning in. Please enjoy season seven of Talking With Traders. Welcome back to another episode of Talking With Traders. And my guest this week is Craig Antoni. Uh, and Craig is the other part of Anbro Capital Investments. Last week, we spoke to Justin Brophy. And this week, we're speaking to his partner, Craig. Craig, welcome to the podcast. Good to have you with us. Thanks, Garth. Yes, happy to be here. As, um, you know, as you say, it's this lovely day in, in the UK. The weather's wonderful. Not. Yeah, not. <laughs> <laughs> but um, yes, I'm happy to be here. Thanks for, for having me. And, you know, yeah, eager to chat and, you know, and discuss the, the unicorn portfolio, which I hope everyone finds quite interesting. Yeah, well, that's exactly it. That's what we're here to talk about is your unicorn product, which is quite an exciting product. It's very cutting edge in terms of new age investments, new themes, looking for growth, where the future growth is going to come from. So, I mean, let's launch right into that, actually. And and I'm going to ask you the question, in, a, in an investing context, what is a unicorn, actually? I mean, we're not talking, you know, ponies with a horn on their nose that little girls like to play with. We, you know, and I'm mean, not being funny about it, but I mean, what is what is a unicorn in, a, in an investment context? Because it's obviously something perceived to be rare, Tell us about it. Sure. Well, you know, in the sort of quintessential sense, the unicorn has always been defined as a, a privately held business that reaches a valuation of a billion dollars. And, you know, once you cross that billion dollar sort of threshold, you become defined a unicorn. Now, initially, these sorts of companies are quite rare, you know, particularly, you know, before sort of recent times, if you like, when there was a lot of money that was sent into venture capital and private equity and that sort of thing. What you had were businesses that were sort of developed, grown, um, funded really by a sort of strong funder base. I mean, grown to a point where they reach a, a relative amount of scale. And that scale is classified in a, in a unicorn sense as a, as a $1 billion valuation. From there, these companies then tended to only, you know, move into the public markets and become listed, whether they be listed in the US, Europe, Asia, whatever the case may be. So the sort of very simple definition of a unicorn is a you know, privately held company that reaches a valuation of a billion dollars. Okay. All right. Interesting. So that's the key. It's a privately held, not a listed company. Now, the, the thing is to get access to one of those companies then, I guess, in the format that you're uh, going about it. Uh, surely you need to wait for them to list then before you can get access to those businesses, right? Yes, that's right. So I'm not sure if, if you or the listeners sort of very familiar with venture capital markets per se. And essentially, venture capital investing is very much a, a hit and miss sort of investment strategy. You know, amongst all the say, hundreds or perhaps even thousands of companies that venture capitalists put money into, there are very few of them that become the next Amazon or Facebook or, or the next billion dollar company, if you like. Yeah. So what we often do is we use the sort of venture cap funding sort of pre-listing base, if you like, as like a screening process where, you know, vent cap funds would go in really at the start of day one when the guys put the, the sign on the door and take it up to a level of sort of complexity or scale where it could essentially lift. You know, we wait for the listing to take place 
And we then, you know, on that premise, hope to find businesses that have already demonstrated that the model they have and the idea that they have and the business that they're running is actually successful and that there is an opportunity for it to succeed in the broader marketplace. So by the time they list, you know, they've ever been around for, you know, a good couple of years already, they've got proper management in place, they have a business, they have a business plan, they're selling a product or a service, and there's some sort of tire hitting the road or rubber hitting the road, so to speak, before they get to the public markets. And it's then in the public markets that we then step in and look for the various opportunities out there and decide, you know, which of those should fit into the portfolio based on the metrics we look at. Okay. All right. Some might say that your know, venture capital, obviously they go in early on. And like you said, the success rate of venture capital uh, investments is very low. Um, I remember reading a book a little while ago saying that something like, there's like only like 2% or whatever ever really make, the, you know, hit the hit their strides and, and really make it. And a very, very large portion of like 90% or more of the investments that venture capital businesses make don't ever amount to anything they basically go to naught so they're relying on those very small that you know the small percentage of companies that will make it big to then um shoot the lights out and recover you know all of the losses of the other 90 odd percent of the investments that they make and more so that they end up with a pretty decent net positive return at the end of the day um the, the i mean i guess one could could argue that by the time venture capital looks to exit the value has been derived do you not, I mean, would that be a fair assessment to make or is that, or am I completely off the mark by, by making that statement? Sure. Well, I think what you have to do is look at the, the sort of type of investors you're looking at. So the venture capital type investor is looking for that, that business that literally starts from scratch or perhaps a little bit more than scratch. So someone that has an idea or a prototype or a widget and you know, they're looking for funding to get the business off the ground. They sort of come in there and they provide, they provide that funding and some management expertise and experience and networking and contacts and try and sort of set the business up and get it, get it on the go. Throughout the life of a company's sort of venture cap stage, if you like, you know, there's various funding rounds that happen from time to time. So, you know, the initial funder might come in and, and that would be a, a series A round, for example, and they will you know, give the business a a million dollars in exchange for a certain amount of equity. As the business starts gaining traction and needs more money, they then go for further funding rounds. And those further funding rounds then are based on valuations of the business at the time. And invariably, they always generally crank up. You know, so if the business is worthwhile and making a success of it, the next funding round, you know, might be done where, you know, the equivalent um, you know, re- required sums to, to fund the business might value it at 10 times the initial million dollars. Yeah. The, the initial event cap investor went with it. So, so it kind of happens along the way. Is there is realized value that happens along the process. And, um, you know, for a lot of them, when they find that big winner and they're coming to the public market, that is an exit strategy for them and it's an, a liquidity event. And, Usually the reason for that is that's the sort of investor they are, that's the type of investment they're looking for. You know, whereas people that invest in the public markets then come and look at it from a much longer term, you know, much more, I guess, um, sort of bigger picture type view. You know, we're not looking to get a business to scale necessarily. We're looking to pick it up then and take it to its next stage of life, which is hopefully, um, you know, much bigger scale, big market penetration, and, you know, the hat we have on in that sort of space is, is multi-year, multi-decade even view. Okay. So I guess it's really a case of different type of investment styles and strategies and the different sort of returns that each style of strategy is looking for. Right. Okay. So I guess, you know, I'm not just thinking off the top of my head, a, a great example of the kind of company that you're talking about would be Facebook or what's now called Meta. Um, it wasn't available in the public markets initially. There was lots of venture capital funding that was raised in various different rounds and by the time that company came to the market which is now gosh probably 10 years ago i don't know but it was a while back um you know one could have at that stage said oh you know this thing's mature the the venture capital guys are getting out the initial funders are selling up and you know the the money's been made but that certainly has not been the case i mean that that stock has done phenomenally well since listing and continues to do pretty well so that's that's an example right Yes, exactly. 
and there, there are many of them like that. You know, if, if one looks at, you know, the founders of these companies, which, you know, is something we'll get into in a second, you know, these are people that have a, an idea or a vision of the business that they, they're trying to build and establish. And, you know, and that goes way beyond the time horizon or way beyond the time horizon of a conventional venture capitalist type investor. I mean, there are many rumors of, um, you know, guys like whether it be uh, Elon Musk or um, Zuckerberg, you know, from Meta, you know, turning down billion dollar offers for their businesses when they were considerably smaller than they, than they are today. Mm. And you can imagine a guy like Mark Zuckerberg, for example, getting an offer for Facebook as it was at the time for a billion dollars when he was in his early 20s. I mean, the easiest thing in the world would have been to accept that and, you know, run off and surf all day and, and do whatever they want. But he did it. You know, he said, no, thanks. Yeah. Um, I see a much bigger sort of picture, you know, ahead of me yeah, where, and the billion dollars wasn't necessarily not a lot of money, but it wasn't part of his plan or part of his idea to cash out and move on. Yeah. And yes, you know, those that sort of stuck with him, even from listing, and I remember the day Facebook listed, it was, you know, quite an interesting day. The, the volume and the share price actually didn't do that well for its first sort of couple of weeks and months even. Yeah. Um, from then on out, it's been a, a phenomenal investment. So mm -hmm. yes, I think, you know, it's, I think it's just a testament to the point that, you know, there's a lot of scope, you know, for companies, even as they exit the sort of private world and come into the public landscape. Okay. All right. Super. So I mean, you, you mentioned that you've got screeners that you look for uh, to try and identify the types of stocks that you would put into your unicorns portfolio. Um, as far as I know, I see, you know, according to the prospectus, you've got 85 stocks currently that make up the unicorns portfolio. So can you give us an idea of what sort of criteria you look at for a company to make it into the portfolio? Sure. Well, there, there are a couple of key things we look at. And the first thing is, as I sort of alluded to just a couple of seconds ago, is founders. You know, we're looking for people that, um, you know, are very passionate leaders and or people that are trying to change the world, you know, for lack of a better word or lack of a better example. And these generally come from people that are truly invested in the business, not just literally invested in terms of the, you know, the shareholdings that they have, but also physically, emotionally and sort of totally invested in the business, the idea, um, the concept, the product, whatever it is that they, they're trying to bring to the market or to the world. And, you know, those founder-led businesses historically have proven to be really, really good investments. And if one looks at it from a South African context, even, you know, if you just think off the top of your head, some of the companies that are founder-led, founder-run, founder-managed that are listed on the JSC, I mean, you think of companies like Discovery, you think of companies like Aspen, you know, you'd probably think of something like Remgrow, um, Bidvest, uh, you know, ShopRite, you know, these are the sorts of businesses that have been phenomenal investments in a South African context, for example. Yeah. And, um, you know, that sort of recipe is one that we think plays true, you know, on a, on a global context. Now, one of the reasons that, you know, that is important is these people don't generally earn a paycheck. You know, and if they do, it's relatively modest. I mean, obviously, everyone's got bills to pay, and you know, their kids to send to school and that sort of thing. But 90%, and in some cases, even more of their wealth is actually tied up in the equity of the businesses that they that they own, run, or manage. Yeah. You know, so they are completely aligned with us as shareholders, where you know, every decision they make, everything they're trying to do, has a long-term mindset. It's a long-term picture. You know, they're thinking of where they want to take this business. 10 or 20 years from today and not three months from today or to the next earnings call or whatever the case may be. Yeah. And that sort of passion and alignment is something that we check for. And that's a big, a big box tick. Um, other than that, you know, we're also looking for companies that have pretty much no debt, you know, so we don't want companies that are reliant on debt or leverage to run their businesses and to survive. They must be either very cash flush you know, which could have happened from, you know, listing or capital raising or whatever the case may be, or preferably cash flush and free cash flow positive and perhaps even profitable. You know, so not all three of those have to be sort of connected in that order, but, you know, having low debt is, is very important and a lot of cash on the balance sheet is requisite. Um, you know, we don't often, or we, we often don't mind investing in companies that might be, 
loss making um, or lack enormous profits in with a in the very short term. You know, if they free cash flow positive or if there's enough cash on the balance sheet to take them through the growth phases that they're in. Um, you know, what you'll find is that a lot of companies in this space are constantly reinvesting in themselves and in their and in their growth pipeline. You know, so although they're selling product and service, they take the money they make and they just pile that straight back into research and development, staffing, marketing and advertising, that sort of thing. You know, so you know, that kind of masks the profitability of the business. But what they're saying is you know, let's scale up, let's get to a, a place where we are a dominant player in the market. And once we're there, you know, we can tap back a bit on that stuff and start taking in the profit. So, you know, they've got a very long term mindset. Um, the other thing that we check for is that companies need to be relatively small when compared to the opportunity ahead of them. You know, so what we're looking for is you know, a business that's looking to tackle, for example, a trillion dollar market, and you know, we'll get to one in, in a minute, um, but where their, their relative size in that market is small. You know, so they can grow at very, very large growth rates. And, um, you know, for a very, very long period of time before they reach any level of maturity or saturation or market dominance. So that's the other thing. Also, then, preferably you want someone that has a, a first mover advantage. You know, so you have an idea or a product or service or whatever the case is, and you try to bring that into the market and you're the first one there with this idea. And, you know, that's a lot of the time how brands are made. Yeah. So if you think of things like, you know, Netflix, you know, they were really the first guys that started having CDs delivered door to door. And then after that, you know, started really streaming as an industry, you know, and, and um, you know, they sort of evolved, you know, tremendously from there. So that's the other thing, you know, that, that you're looking for is a first mover advantage. And then preferably, you know, a company that has a product or, or service or solution that solves a headache, you know, for their customers. You know, something that if you think about is a real grind in your life, and that you really couldn't be bothered. And, you know, if someone comes along and says, well, I've got a solution for you or a product that causes you stress or angst or frustration, and I can solve that for you. Straight away, you know, you're satisfying a need and, you know, you're creating a, potentially if you play your cards right, a long-term relationship, you know, with your clients and that stickiness and loyalty, you know, will go with you for a long time. Um, another one of the things, obviously, is, you know, we're looking for companies that are operating in markets that are growing quite fast. You know, so we want, you know, segments of the economy that are growing faster than GDP. Mm -hmm. Then we also want companies that are growing faster than the markets that they're operating in. So in other words, you know, someone that's gaining market share yeah. on, a, on a fairly regular and consistent basis. Um, now, there's obviously lots of companies out there, lots of opportunities out there that we find on a daily basis. So, you know, these sort of filters are important to get to to make sure that you have sort of the right leader with the right sort of balance sheet, with the right idea, you know, the right market opportunity, et cetera. Um, but we've seen over time that these sorts of companies and share prices tend to be quite volatile. Yeah. And they can bounce around quite a lot. And, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, we tend to have a greater spread in the portfolio to try and mitigate some of that volatility. Um, you know, all the stocks we have generally, well, pretty much all of them, we trade with a beta of greater than what, you know, so they're always moving up or down by a greater degree than the market. And that obviously works wonderfully when it's a bull market and everything's yeah. going up, going up way faster than the market can also harm a bit when you have the opposite. You know, so we're trying to spread the, the risk by having, you know, a great number of stocks in the portfolio and also further spread it by having diversified exposure in terms of different sectors and that sort of thing. Right. Okay. All right. Interesting. It's a nice ex explanation of what you look for. I must say it's very um, clearly understood now. And are you finding any uh, major themes that are really tickling your fancy at the moment? That, that Or is it very broad across different sectors? I mean... It's something I've spoken to with a number of our guests on this podcast in this particular season has been around the thematic investing and what are the themes that seem to be dominant in terms of future growth outlook. And, you know, the usual stuff comes up, artificial intelligence, um, you know, semiconductors and the, the related things around that, et cetera, et cetera. From your perspective, are there any really dominant themes that you're seeing coming up again and again as as 
decent investment opportunities within the context of this unicorn definition that you've given to us? Sure. Well, I mean, the, the opportunities are pretty vast, actually. I mean, they can come across a whole host of different sectors and economic spaces and, and even within first world and emerging market type economies as well. But, you know, when we sort of zoom out and we look at it from a really big picture, there's three sort of mega themes, if you like, which, which we think sort of play true and have done for quite a long time. Um, the first is consumption. You know, we as, as human beings on the planet consume, you know, whether it be, you know, data or yeah. whether it be software or whether it be food and beverages, or, you know, healthcare, whatever the case is, we consume. And, um, you know, repeat purchasing and consumption is something that is pretty much a fait accompli, you know, for, for people that are out there. So, you know, human consumption is, is one of the things we look at. And that can be nuanced, and it can be across a whole host of different sectors and across different sort of demographics even. Mm. Now, if one considers, say, you know, first world economies like Japan, you know, they have an aging population. So, you know, their consumption needs could be very different from a population cohort in South Africa. You know, it tends to be younger, more upwardly mobile. You know, so, you know, one can put those puzzle pieces together and, and, and look for consumption trends. Um, the other thing which sort of tips a bit into what I just alluded to in, Jap in Japan is, um, you know, medicine and pharma. You know, that's another big thing. Mm. Now, whether you're an emerging market country like, say, South Africa and many others out there that require, um, you know, medicine and pharmaceuticals and that sort of thing for younger, for, for younger populations growing, or whether you're an older population that requires, you know, different sorts of medicine, different sorts of healthcare, and has different sort of healthcare requirements, that whole pharmaceutical um, sort of sphere is something that comes in into play. And obviously, you know, one of the other big of the guest themes at the moment, if one looks at it from a subsector, would be things like, um, you know, these, these fancy weight loss drugs that have now taken the market by storm, WeGovy and things like that from Northern Nordisk and, and Eli Lilly. Yeah. And, um, you know, the impact they might have on, on weight loss, so which might have sort of concomitant impact on things like, um, you know, medical devices and operations and diabetes and, and that sort of thing. You know, so we sort of keep an eye on that, on that as well. And then the other theme, which is perhaps the most obvious, I guess, for, for people in our day and age is technology. Theme, which is perhaps, you know, the most obvious you know, for, for people in, in our day and age and our generation is that of technology. And technology can be, you know, overarching and cover a vast sort of array of different areas, whether it be things like cybersecurity, you know, which is something we need and use every day without even realizing it, to something perhaps a bit more nuanced, um, where, you know, you're getting specialized advertising sent to you on your, on your phone or your laptop, um, you know, which is something that you you not necessarily even know why you're consuming or how you're consuming it, but you are. And mm. then there's, of course, the more sort of traditional sort of technology type products that we might use, whether it be, you know, things like your, your Apple iPhone, or as you said, you know, the semiconductor type product that, you know, you might have in your laptop or in the AR product that you might use. Mm. So you know, technology is a force, I think, which is unstoppable. And it really overlays itself across all the other sort of themes that might be out there in the world because they, they generally are deflationary by nature so they help bring costs down um, you know they're more efficient to help make things more efficient on a daily basis and, and help streamline things as well yeah so i guess it would be those you know as sort of as a sort of synopsis it'd be those would be the three big trends that we look at so right on consumption um healthcare and pharmaceuticals and technology Right. Okay. Okay. Super. And I want to get into the part where we get a little bit more specific because obviously listeners to this podcast, A, they can in invest in your product, which we will talk about at the end, how they can do that. But also um, I want to get a couple of ideas of some stock examples from you. Um, and maybe we can go through each of those themes and just give us one from each, for example. And what, what would a, a current stock pick be in the consumption theme that, that you're invested in? Well, in the consumption space, I mean, the one that we, the one where I can talk about today is um, a company called Shopify. Now, right. You know, it's a little bit, um, it's a, well, I suppose it could overlay into technology as well, but 
But basically what Shopify does is they're creating an online marketplace for people that are trying to start a business online. And you know, that sort of business can can be anything from a literally a mom and pop shop who's trying to sell cakes or bolt on and have that delivered, you know, all over SA to even some really big clients that they have on their platform, which would include things like um or people like Netflix um and even Nike. Yeah. Know? So if you're trying to create an online store and are looking really for the building blocks, you know, they can do that in a in a sort of drop and go away. That's where Shopify comes into play. Now, you know, Shopify founder is a guy by the name of Toby Lutka. Um, you know, he has about seven odd percent of the um, of the shares in Shopify. Shopify's current market cap is about sixty billion dollars. Yeah. You know, so there's real money that he has sort of aligned with us as shareholders. Now, to give you a sense of the opportunity that that Shopify has, as I said, it's a sixty billion dollar market cap. Um, they came out with results actually last night, which were really really good. You know, they're putting gross merchandise values through their online shopping platform, which are on track to reach just over $200 billion this year. Wow. Now, if one looks at, say, a retail landscape and you say, well, this is a company that helps people sell products online and they've helped people sell, call it $200 billion worth of products online, well, how does that look in the big scheme of things? You know, that's just a number, right? Well, mm. the retail market in the U.S. alone is a five trillion dollar market, you yeah. know, and if one then takes that to the global stage, you know, it's considerably, you know, bigger than that. And they're just putting two hundred billion through the platform. So that gives you an idea of how the size of this business is relative to the opportunity set mm-hmm. ahead of, as we alluded to. Yeah. Um, in terms of earnings that are coming out, I mean, earnings are growing at you know twenty odd. 23% per annum, I think, if I remember correctly, that was the last set of numbers we saw. Now, you know, in a world where interest rates have shot up from 0 to 5%, you know, people are worried about, you know, growth and, and all the rest of it. You know, they're still able to grow, you know, good solid double digit numbers, you know, yeah. 20, 20% plus. Um, you know, so that's a business that we think is is a good solid company. It's a, it's a growth business. They've had some challenges over the last year or so. You know, they bit off a bit more they could, than they could chew during COVID. But, you know, they've taken the knocks and they've come back strong. And I think that's the other thing we like to see with a management team like that where, you know, they're not afraid to make the tough decisions and they're not afraid to make long-term decisions, which, you know, they think are in the best interest of the business, even if it does require some short-term pain. And uh, yeah, they seem to be coming better, you know, coming out of that better. Okay. So All right, one. super. Yeah. And what about the healthcare and pharmaceuticals theme? Well, healthcare and pharmaceuticals, I mean, there's, you know, there are a couple we have in that space. Um, I think that the one which is probably, you know, our, our most exciting one in our view is a company called Dexcom. And what Dexcom does is diabetes management. You know, so, you know, they partner up with some of the, you know, sort of famous, um, famous people in the world that also have diabetes that have helped them you know, really market their business and help them just identify how hard it is to live with something like diabetes and how it's not an insurmountable problem, you know, and they've got a platform, you know, already it's, a, it's an app that works on the cell phone, which monitors your blood um, and glucose levels via a pouch that you stick onto your body and it helps you manage your, you know, your diabetes with relative ease. Now, diabetes is a, is obviously a, a very big and growing market, you know, and you know, there's different streams of it, type one and type two. Yeah. Obviously, some people are bored with it. Some people succumb to it through lifestyle and that sort of thing. And they sort of cover that market broadly. And, um, you know, they, they're a business which is, I think, doing, doing well by doing good, you know, if that's a, a way mm. to, to put it. And, and that's something we like as well. So you have a diabetes market, which is, you know, a massive market in a global context. They are, in our view, the top dog or, you know, or top mover in that space with their platform. And we think that, you know, they have a very long runway ahead of it from a, from a growth perspective. And, I mean, they were also a company that was, you know, the share price being under a little bit of pressure this year because of all these um, weight loss drugs and people worrying about how that might affect the diabetes market long term. Yeah. And their results were out last week. And, again, were a phenomenal set of results. You know, and shareholders were rewarded with a very nice bump in the share price. You know when those numbers came out, and you know, and people could see that just 
because there's some good weight loss drugs out there doesn't mean you know, our problems are all over and overnight at least. Yes. So, okay. That's, that's that one. And then in the tech space, I mean, I know you said that Shopify can sort of dovetail into tech as well, but um, what would be a, a good example of a unicorn stock in the technology theme that, you, that you're interested in at the moment? Yeah, well, I sort of alluded a little bit to the industry it was in a couple of minutes ago, and, and this is a company called The Trade Desk. Now, The Trade Desk is an online programmatic advertising platform. And, um, you know, they're an interesting one because, you know, as I, as I said, you know, you might be online and, you know, you start getting adverts for things that, you know, sometimes you think are completely irrelevant and you don't know why you're getting them. And then there are others which, is, which you're getting, which you start thinking, hmm, is someone sort of watching me? Yet? You know, yeah. like, how did they know? Yes, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you know, and what the trade desk club is that is they have a an algorithm and a platform which really looks at you as an individual and the things you're looking at or searching for or whatever the case might be, and then helps you see the adverts that are more relevant or more pertinent to you. Now they are almost like a middleman between say an advertising advertising agency and a customer, and they're agnostic. You know, so they're not trying to steal the customer from the advertising agency, you know, and they're not trying to compete with the advertising agency per se. Um, you know, they sort of provide a platform. And what this platform does is, say, for example, you know, for lack of a, a better example, you are Coca-Cola and you're looking to, you know, send out an ad. And your brief is, you know, it's the, the World Cup cricket, you know, which is on at the moment, you know, and we're looking for a demographic which must be, you know, it's not necessarily meant to be sexist comment or anything like that, but, yeah. a, a, you know, men between the age of, or men are males between the age of 15 and 25, because they tend to watch cricket. Right. And, um, you know, and particularly, you know, people that are in, say, you know, the um, sort of Asian Asian communities or, you know, where India, for example, where cricket's massive there. Yeah. Um, so this is just like a hypothetical example. But then, you know, what the trade desk does is it collects all this data and information. And if you happen to be a person of, say, you know, Asian descent that's between that age demographic and you're on your phone scrolling through your games or playing, um, you know, or going through YouTube or Instagram or whatever the case may be, you're likely to see an advert for Coke. Yeah. You know, so not only does it try to um, really sharpshoot advertising, but it tries to make sure that people that invest in advertising get the biggest bang for their advertising buck that they can get. Now, you know, it's a, it's a comment we've made before, but it's well known in the advertising industry that most people that advertise say that they're quite sure that they waste 50% of that money. They just don't know what 50% of it is, you know, <laughs> which 50% they're wasting. Yeah. So what these guys try and do is make sure that, you know, literally every buck cent is spent is sent to the right sort of cohort. And similarly, you know, if you're someone like Louis Vuitton that's trying to sell a handbag to a certain demographic, um, you know, in Central um, Central Asia or North America, whatever the case may be, they could use that same product. Yeah. Now, you know, the global advertising industry is expected to cross over, you know, a trillion dollars next year in 2024. That's pretty much what com countries, governments, NGOs, whatever you like, um, companies are spending on advertising on an annual basis. Now, the trade desk in that context has a $35 billion market cap. Wow. So it's tiny. Um, you know, they have no debt. They have $1.5 billion in cash on the balance sheet. Their founder has about 10% of the stock. Um, you know, and, you know, a company that's turning over, you know, considerably less than a trillion dollars a year. Let's put it that way. Yeah. You know, so, so you have a, you know, an opportunity where, you know, they are growing far faster than the advertising industry. The advertising industry is massive yeah. and growing. Yeah. And people are looking at ways to better funnel and spend their money in that space. You know, so, you know, they start to, I think, to a lot of business, the things like connected TV, for example, and streaming and that sort of thing. And, um, you know, that's another example of a business that is doing really well with a massive opportunity ahead of it. Okay. All right. That's very interesting. So that's three great examples you've given us there, Craig. Thanks very much. And they're all very exciting in their own right. Now, let's just talk about the, the Unicorns product a bit. Um, now you've described to us what Unicorns are, what the sort of themes you're looking at, examples of shares. Um, we mentioned earlier that there's 85 stocks that are in the portfolio. So it is nice and diversified. Um, 
but the, the, logistically, this thing is it trades as is it, is it right that it trades as a note or is it an ETF or what? what how does a, a, an investor access this product? Sure. Well, there's two ways to get to it. The first is as an exchange traded note, or better known in, in our world as an actively managed certificate, an AMC. Okay. So it trades on the JSE and also in, um, in Switzerland for for those that that didn't okay. know. Yep, and it trades as it's pretty much it's very similar to an ETF structure, you know. So you have a basket of shares which are consolidated into a single unit price, and um, that price reflects the overall you know value of the underlying shares in the portfolio. So a similar concept to buying something like the Patrick Forty, you know, uh, as in as an example. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. yeah. Go on. And the other and the other way to get access to it is as a unit trust. So we have it as unit trust as well, and there it's on you know various various platforms. I mean, you know, Sunlam Glacier is probably the biggest one, um, but it's on, you know, all the major platforms as well. Okay. So there's two ways, you know, people can access the portfolio if they're interested. Yeah, that's super. I didn't realize that it was listed in Switzerland as well. That's quite interesting for your foreign investors that are not, uh, people that are not RAND investors, they can access it as well through the offshore market. What is the, what is the share code of this product, both on the JSE and in Switzerland? Well, under in Switzerland, we trade under its ISIN. Yeah, um, it's obviously quite long. I mean, I can have to okay. share that. Um, on the JSE side, it's um the share code is UABCPA. UABCPA. That's correct. All right. Okay. All right. And then the, in in Switzerland, one should just search for the ISIN for it. Um, yeah. to get that because you say it's a long number all right no that's fair enough but it's interesting that it's available both and now tell me do you guys make a market as well in the in these um in the note or in the amc as you referred to it i mean is there a bid offer spread that's easily available should one want to buy it uh at any given time on the jsc for example or in switzerland yes yeah, so yeah the amc is managed or the structure is managed by ubs okay um, UBS also make a market for it. So, you know, the, the market, you know, they always have a bit of offer on the screen at, you know, at any time. And um, there is a spread, which is, uh, it's about a 1% spread between the buy and the sell, which is really the same as it is for any ETF, you know. So, yeah. everyone looks at, you know, whether it be, you know, the Satrix 40 or S&P 500 tracker or whatever, you know, there's always that kind of spread. Um, so, it's pretty normal. And um, yeah, they make sure that, you know, if you're looking to get in or out, you know, the, you know, there's always a buyer or a seller for you. And then obviously there's a, there's a secondary market around it as well. Sure. You know, where there are existing people that, that invest in them and buy and sell it. But, um, you know, so I suppose trading within the double, you know, is, you know, be likely from a more secondary sort of market participants. Um, but trading outside or on, on the double really would be dealing with the market maker. Okay. All right. Super. And, uh, in terms of the weightings, you said there's 85 stocks that are a part of the, the unicorns portfolio. How are they weighted? Is it equal weighted or are some bigger than others? How does that look? Sure. So when the portfolio was started, it was equally weighted. So everything, you know, came in as a as a best idea with an equal weighting. Okay. As times progressed, you know, those weightings have obviously shifted, as you can imagine. Yeah. And um, you know, what we find obviously is that you know, those companies that do well obviously become bigger weights in the portfolio. Mm. Those that don't become smaller weights in the portfolio. And ultimately what happens is, um, you know, those that have, you know, very small weightings almost become irrelevant over time. Mm. You know, and the portfolio then always tends to be focusing on those companies that are performing well. So it's almost like a process of natural selection, you know, for lack of a, a better example, you know, where you have a bunch of great ideas and, you know, we, we add ideas into the portfolio on a, on a fairly regular basis as we find them. But the, the market's got a way of sorting out the, you know, the wheat from the chaff. Sure. And those companies that perform um, become more and more relevant in the portfolio and, and, and then as a result in the portfolio's valuation. Right. So, um, you know, unlike, other sort of ETFs, which are index trackers and that sort of thing, we don't reweight um, by, say, you know, selling the the winning type stocks and you know reinvesting in the losing type stocks. The losing stocks have to prove themselves to justify their position, and if they do, 
and you know they start emerging as a you know as a as a winner from a previous lease you know we obviously can look to allocate more capital to it right. um, but what we found over time is that you know winners win yeah you know, the companies that are winning that are doing really well continue to do so mm. um, and those that don't often battle and you know often fight for relevance and and that's not what this particular portfolio is all about. I mean, this is a blue sky portfolio. We're looking at companies that are you know, looking to change the world. So, you know, long way of answering the question, but it started off equally weighted, but, you know, it sorted itself out over time. Yeah. Um, obviously, last year, you know, the growth sector had a massive sell-off, you know, yeah. as interest rates sort of rocketed higher and you had you know, the remnants of COVID and supply chains and the war with Russia and Ukraine. Um, you know, the, the growth sector really came at a significant amount of pressure last year. And, you know, we used that opportunity to just refine the strategy a little bit and say, okay, you know, what happened here? How do we sort of prevent this from happening again? And how do we fix, you know, some of the gaps that we found happened there? So from a weighting perspective, and I know that's probably something you're going to ask me next, you know, we, we have decided to cap the weightings now where, um, we have a sort of cap between 10 and 15% if something gets to that sort of range. Um, yeah. You know, we will look to to trim it back. The other sort of rule of thumb weighting, I suppose, weighting, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, like a rebalance. Yeah. yeah. Uh, like a weighting barometer would be if we start to lose sleep over it. Okay. Yeah. So if the stock becomes a, a position that, you know, becoming big and it's something we becoming acutely aware of and you're a bit worried about it, you know, we'll use that as a as a as a sign to actually trim a bit as well. Okay. So yeah, there's there's no sort of fixed and firm rule because I think that the big problem you have as a as a unicorn investor, you know, and one can take an example of some of the best investments you you've ever had, whether it be an Amazon or in an SA context a, a ShopRite or a Bidvest, you mm. know. If you had bought a, a bid vest 20 years or so ago and, you know, kept adding to your position on a monthly basis, you know, that position is probably an enormous piece of your portfolio today. Yeah. And not, not only that, but you also got bid corp, you know, which in itself has become a, a rock star investment. Yeah. So you don't want to be in a position where you keep cutting back, you know, that potential from your long-term wealth and your long-term savings plan. Yeah. That's sort of a hat that we you know that we put on. But you know, after you saw such a collapse in markets last year, and particularly in the growth space, it's something you thought, well, you know, we have to be cognizant of that, you know, particularly for investors out there that are worried about drawdowns, you know, which can be quite violent when the world goes through, you know, periods of turmoil. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So that's interesting. So when I mean, you have kind of answered the question, because I was going to ask if any of these these businesses can effectively grow into the sky um, to the point where they become disproportionately large holding in the portfolio. But you've said that you're looking to cap it at sort of 15 odd percent um, if it, if any of the individual holdings should ever get to that point. Okay, so I understand that um, pretty well. And just lastly, on the weighting issue, you know, I know that this product has been going for a little while, but it's so it's relatively new. When did you start it? Well, the, the unicorn as a AMC listed at the end of 2018. Okay. All right. So, all right. So it's got sort of five, nearly six years of, um, of history behind it now. Okay. So if I come in just for example, as a new investor and it's hypothetically, say I had $10 million, which I don't, but if I did have $10 million that I wanted to invest into this product, I mean, I would go, presumably I can't buy that on screen because that's a big number, but um, get UBS to facilitate the back end. I mean, would the weightings that I receive in the portfolio now reflect the weightings that everybody else has got based on the fluctuations that have had over time? It wouldn't be a new investment that comes and gets equally weighted now. It would be structured on the current weightings of everything as it is for all the other existing investors. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So, okay. so in theory, what happens is, um, you know, there's, I suppose it's a double-edged sword. You know, people that are getting in today are already, I guess, benefiting from that natural selection, you know, where the markets come along and said, okay, well, you know, which are the better ones? Which are the ones that are outperforming? Um, you know, we've also, as I said earlier, done a lot of work on um, sort of making sure that we've adapted our investment strategy to really, I guess, compensate why the world changed. 
you know, over the last year or two. Yeah. Um, you know, for example, people have no time now in the investing markets for, you know, companies that are small and unprofitable, loss making, and mm-hmm. have, um, you know, no um, sort of clear and immediate pathway to profit. Okay. So, you know, where in a previous life, we might have had a one or two shares like that that had enormous promise. Um, now we would no longer have those total shares in the portfolio. You know, people want a, now the market has changed, the world has changed. They're looking for a straight line to profitability with the same characteristics and traits that I alluded to earlier. Yeah. Uh, so we've made sure then that, you know, portfolio is adapted to that. Yes. Also, as part of that process, you know, we did realize a, a sum of cash, which is now sitting in the portfolio. So the portfolio is overweight cash at the moment yeah. um, relative to its history. And, um, you know, that's more by um, design than as part of the investment style. You know, we tend to be fully invested all the time. Huh. Um, but as we're going through this process now of sort of rejigging the portfolio, we've let the cash sit there just to see how the world unfolds. Okay. You know, um, it's obviously it's, it's perhaps a different discussion to have, but, you know, markets haven't done a heck of a lot of, um, readjustment considering the massive raise in interest rates that we've had. You know, just yeah. the tensions have, you know, continually escalated. And we said, well, let's just earn the side of caution. So, you know, we, we kept a little bit of cash in, in the portfolio. And as, you know, we get those adjustments, we'll, you know, we'll look to redeploy that. So it's arguably a little bit more, um, I guess, um, conservatively positioned than it ordinarily is. Yeah. But you know, once we get the green light from a valuation perspective or a pricing perspective, then we will rapidly look to, to redeploy. Yeah, excellent. All right, Craig. And then last question is, how can investors uh, or potential investors access more information about this product if they are uh, interested in potentially putting some money into it? Sure. Well, I mean, there's the, the Anbro website is something that anyone can go to. It's anbro.co. And, you know, on that website, there are links to the, you know, individual websites for all the, the satellite portfolios that we run. And the Unicorn is, is the one we're talking about. It also has its own unique website as well, which is investingunicorns.com. Yeah. Uh, so if people want to go directly to that, they're more than welcome to do that. And on there, you know, there'll be, you know, the fact sheets, a um, bit of information about the portfolio. Uh, there's also, you know, previous um, interviews or, um, chats that we've had with you know chats like yourself got and you know over time and then also the notes that we've sent out to you know to our clients so you know there's a bit of information there as well I and mean, then obviously if people want to you know reach out and have a chat you know justin and i are available and our contact details are there so you know happy to to have a chat and discuss anything with with anyone Fantastic. All right, super. Well, this has been very interesting, Craig. Thanks very much. Um, I've I've learned a lot and it's great to understand more about unicorns, more about how you select them and the themes that you're looking at. It's been a good discussion. So thank you very much for joining me on this episode of Talking with Traders. Thank you very much for your time, God. Appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for joining us for today's episode of Talking with Traders, brought to you by IG, a world leading CFD provider. We really are privileged to have such a leader in the field of online trading involved in this series. Please follow us on Facebook and engage with us there. And a reminder to make sure you subscribe to this series by clicking on the subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. If you've enjoyed this podcast, we'd also appreciate if you'd leave a review on the app too. Till next time.